Okay, today we're still talking about something called strategic alliances. In, in, the, previous, uh, in the previous section about marketing, talk about enter a market in terms of marketing strategy. Um, this is slightly different than your thinking because this is about entering a market in terms of how you operationally enter the market. It's not, it's you know, how you sell things, how you do business in that market, not really about marketing. Um, so last uh, lesson, I, I went through the shades of uh, how you can enter a market, a very soft, controlled entrance versus uh, risky, higher investment strategy, <clears throat> including foreign direct investment, building factories and whatnot. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to continue on that, but before, um, before so we go, up in your horizontal. but before we go there. I think we should at least refresh our, ourselves on this idea of horizontal versus vertical integration. Um, so when we have, uh, when we say uh, vertical integration, we're talking about the steps, <coughs> excuse me, the steps that start from the raw materials that you get, so if you're coffee company, you'll have the beans and the farms and the farmers, and that'll lead to the processing of the beans and the roasting of the beans in some kind of production, uh, perhaps some plant, some factory. And there, we'll also do packaging, and then from there, we'll ship the coffee to a distribution center, and then it'll be distributed either retail or wholesale or sold abroad or export it. So there's a lot of choices that can happen at that level. So that's vertical integration. At the end of vertical integration, we're at the, we start with the beans and we end up with the customer. So vertical integration implies anything along that chain that starts with the raw materials and ends with the customer. So if we're going to um, uh, add integration, if we're going to add something to that chain or we're going to buy part of that chain to control it better than we would. That's vertical integration. If we think about the same chain and we think about all the farmers, all the factories that can roast coffee, all the different distributors that can distribute the coffee, all the different retailers that can sell the coffee, then we're talking about the levels of horizontal markets. So that's the difference between vertical and horizontal. So before we listen to this video, you should know that. Um, short, it's only five minutes. So let's go through it. Then your exams, horizontal and vertical integration. Now I've mentioned that these terms are usually made in connection with trying to explain the reasons why firms engage in external growth, such as takeovers and mergers. And uh, whilst it's a relatively important concept, it's important to keep it fairly simple. So in terms of the direction of integration as a result of these external growth strategies, the first thing to remember is that there are there is a possibility of going in a vertical direction, either forward forward integration or backwards, backward integration. So, if we're uh, vertical, verticals from the suppliers, from the farms to the customer. If we go forward, we're going towards the customer. And if we go backwards, that means we're going towards the raw materials. So backwards is towards the source and forwards is towards the customer. And the alternative is to go from side to side, what's known as horizontal integration. Now to understand the nature of these terms, the important thing is just to reflect on what happens in what's known as the supply chain in a business. Let's look at a, a simple example of a supply chain. This will help us explain uh, this, uh, these concepts of, uh, of integration. 
A supply chain might be a simple one like this. You've got businesses involved in the, uh, the uh, supply of raw materials. Those raw materials may then be put into a manufacturing process. The output from a manufacturing process might then go to distributors, and those distributors in turn uh, are likely to pass the finished goods onto retailers, and of course then on to final consumers like you and I. That is an example of the supply chain working from left to right, from raw materials to manufacturing, onto the distributor and finally onto the retailers. And in terms of integration, uh, a business may decide to try to move up the supply chain or forward. Of course, it could also move down the supply chain or backwards. So, in terms of takeovers, these terms, let's just quickly define what they mean and then give you a couple of examples to, uh, to illustrate them. In terms of forward integration, what we're looking at there is moving up, moving forward through the supply chain. For example, a manufacturer deciding to buy a distributor of its products. So that's what we're going to talk about today is acquisition. So um, these are companies. So the, fir the first thing to understand, these are growth strategies. So when you're expanding to a foreign market, obviously you're trying to grow your business. You don't have to choose one of these strategies, but they're very common um, in terms of acquiring companies uh, or merging. So uh, here they're just... Uh, yeah, they're going forward, further up the supply chain, so the manufacturer would buy the distributor, which is one step closer to the customer. Backwards, uh, business operating earlier, so a retailer buys a wholesaler. I don't know why they would do that, but they could, and that would be one step back towards the manufacturer. Horizontal means the same stage of the supply chain. We've seen that in the supply chain you can go backwards. So backwards integration, vertical integration, involves a business moving earlier in the supply chain. For example, a retailer buying a wholesaler, or a manufacturing business buying a supplier of raw materials. And we've mentioned that you can also go from side to side. A horizontal integration strategy involves buying a business that is operating at the same stage of the supply chain. For example, a manufacturer buying another manufacturer, a retailer buying a retailer. There is one fourth direction of integration which we're not going to cover in this video, we'll do a separate video on diversification where the takeover or the merger has no connection with the business and the supply chain. It's an entirely different industry. It's called diversification or conglomerate integration, and as I say, we'll deal with that one in a separate video. Well, hopefully that's helped uh, set the scene in terms of these different types of uh, terms. Let's have a look at a, a couple of examples just to help illustrate them. Forward integration, here's a, here's a takeover that took place in 2016, and it involved a business called the Booker Group. The Booker Group is one of the UK's largest wholesalers. Uh, it runs a, large, a bit like Costco, well, very much like Costco, it runs large wholesale operations which uh, serve uh, individuals but mainly small retailers and what the Booker Group did was it agreed a takeover of a very large chain of convenience stores, a retail business called Londis and Budget, there were 2,000 stores there. That was an example of a distributor acquiring a retailer, in other words moving up or forward up the supply chain for integration. Here's an example of backwards integration. The business on the right will certainly be familiar with IKEA, one of the world's largest uh, and iconic uh, global retailer of furniture and household goods. And what IKEA did in 2016 was to make a significant purchase of forests and their associated equipment, uh, the, wood, the wood cutters and collectors in Romania and Bulgaria. What it was doing it was it's, uh, wanting to ensure that its manufacturing business had access to raw materials, so it's moving back into the supply chain. An example of backwards integration. And finally, here's an example of horizontal integration. There are lots of these. You often see retailers buying other retailers. In this case, this is one of the world's largest hotel businesses, Marriott, uh, buying a business called Starwood Hotels, which includes a whole bunch of brands, including Sheraton Hotels. And as a result of that takeover, which was finally approved in 2016, Marriott became the world's largest 
hotel chain. Classic example of a horizontal integration where you've got a retail or service business buying a very close competitor. So there we go, that's that. All right, that's it. So <clears throat> I just wanted to introduce that again. So when you think about your ideas about what you would want to do, uh, or what you would advise someone to do in entering a market, you might consider um, some of the factors or some of you would at least understand what someone's talking about if they say they would want to buy a supplier, they would be going and doing backwards integration, uh, backwards vertical integration. Uh, local examples include um, football. Um, coffee. As far as I know, up until about four, three or four years ago, they didn't have any retail operations whatsoever. They were mostly selling in supermarkets. They didn't make their coffee. They had no baristas. Um, and they took advantage of maybe the change in the market. These new coffee shops that were selling. Um, they had one shop. I shouldn't say that. They had one shop on Dom Coy Street, which was kind of like their sample shop for tourists and customers, and it was pretty good. Um, but they didn't branch out, they didn't have a brand name that stuck out, you didn't really see their brand around town. Now we have, uh, they have pretty, I would say their main competitor is Coffee House, for example. But they still have an advantage on most other coffee places because they have their own beans, they have their own, they started with the beans, so they don't have to pay profits to suppliers of beans. So they integrated forward towards the customers, so by establishing a retail operation. <coughs> okay, so you should have your book open. Um, I'm on page 40. 45, um, so we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about the uh, idea of acquisitions and mergers to get that out of the way. So one way that you may enter a market would be to take over someone else. So, in, 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 the, in the scope, this is in the, this is in the middle, right? So in the beginning, we have using basic postal services, Amazon, current companies that do online sales to sell into another country. Second level is to hire somebody or have a, a base of importing within that country, like an agent or sometimes called a dealer. Uh, you make a contract with them to be an exclusive seller in that country. A lot of trust involved, but <clears throat> less risk. You're just sending product for money. On the other side of it, you're going to build your own factory, build your own shops, deal with local landlords, real estate purchases, pay all the different taxes and all the different potential cost bribes that you might have to pay in order to get involved and to really open up a factory in that country. So that's the farthest level and this is in the middle. So instead of starting your own factory and investing all that money, you just take an operation that's already running and you acquire it. So uh, again, franchising is still closer to the, uh, to the simpler ways the less risky ways to enter a market. Acquisition starts to be quite risky because you're going to be spending uh, a lot of money to buy that company, although it will be set up already. So you don't, and, and they probably have staff and employees and you don't have to do those things. So I'm on page 45, <clears throat> acquisition. Acquisition provides a quicker start benefit in exploiting an overseas market. The business buys another that has been operating. Businesses acquire target businesses as a growth strategy, this is what this is all about, because it can create a bigger, more competitive, and more cost-efficient company. 
This exploits synergy and economies of scale if you're lucky. Two businesses together are more valuable than they are apart, combining skills, expertise, especially when you're in new markets. Uh, potential technological improvements, capital, um, meaning money coming from overseas. So for the business, of course, it has those benefits and uh, you'd hope for the customers there would be a benefit too. When a target business is acquired, it ceases to exist and becomes part of the purchase business, purchasing business. This is a uh, big fish eats another fish, a fish eats a fish kind of situation. There's only one fish in the end. Acquisitions are commonly made by buying the majority of company shares if it's a public company. Um, there are a few different kinds of acquisitions. Um, let's see, there's one acquisition that comes to mind in Vietnam. It was fairly recent. <clears throat> Very popular Vietnamese uh, bakery chain for many years. I remember it when I lived here. And they were bought by this uh, Mandalay company, which looks like a French company, Mandalay. So they wanted to uh, run this uh, Kindo operation.
looks like mooncakes, but they really uh, they really cut down on the brands. I mean, you can see the website is quite weak. They're really not doing much. <clears throat> um, so I'm not sure this has been a very successful takeover. Bondelay is Kindo's new company, launched in 2015. It's a powerful combination of snack leaders uh, for the much loved brands of Vietnamese consumers. Ritz crackers, Oreos, stand up with Oreos. Mm, I guess. Cadbury chocolate. So they were the ones who were responsible for this Oreo Cadbury mix of uh, chocolate covered Oreos. I guess they're responsible for that. Um, don't know. Not sure if that was a very successful merger. It doesn't really look like they're doing a whole lot. And there are, but there are more and more companies. And I saw it in the newspaper recently. Um, who want to take over Vietnamese companies and run them. Uh, maybe, maybe they're making more. Um, this would be an acquisition. acquisition. But they wanted to be in the Vietnamese market. So Mondelez completely acquires Kingo Corporation. Um, they required the, they acquired the remaining 20% stake in the company. What is their goal? I mean, their goal is uh, $90 million for the whole, whole snack business. I guess it was a fairly cheap deal. <clears throat> um, what's the point of it? Two years after acquiring Kindo, Mondelez finds the deal a game changer as its products are now available across Vietnam. <clears throat> the company's Vietnamese-based factories are increasing their capacity to also export to other ASEAN countries, China and Japan. So maybe that was the goal. Maybe it was the goal was to create a company that would be better at exporting. Um, So they're, they, wanted, they wanted to have our factories, they wanted to have our bakeries, so that's probably why they did it. Different goals, right? Sometimes uh, you find like, uh, so if you have a free trade agreement like AZN, and you're, once you're in the AZN zone, you no longer have tariffs to sell to Thailand, Myanmar, and all the other countries within the AZN. So therefore, if you acquire one company in Vietnam that's in Asia, then you are able to take advantage of the free trade area that it is in. So that is potentially Mondelez's goal is to, in the future, is to take over or at least to be part of the entire Southeast Asian market. Smart. Could be smart. Um, most acquisitions, uh, our book has a very extended a uh, section about acquisitions and it has a picture of a bear on page 45. Um, acquisitions are kind of amusing, I guess, or fun in a way, in the sense that um, they can happen in a, in a friendly way. You just offer a price to a private company and they just sell themselves to you. That's one way. Now, if, you, if a company has shareholders, multiple shareholders, then you get into the cases where either you have to publicly go and buy the shares if the public recognizes that a company is trying to take over another company, then perhaps they hold on to their shares a little bit longer and cause the share price to go up making it more expensive for the company to take over the other company. On the other hand, you don't have to own 100% shares in a company that you're trying to take over in order to have voting rights. So there's a little bit of a, a, a democracy within the, the shareholders, the voting rights of shareholders. So if you own more than 50% of voting shares, then you have what is already considered to be a a control, controlling uh, stake in the business, 
And you can make decisions no matter what the other 49% of the shareholders want. So if the other 49% of the shareholders feel happy and you, know, you feel like, well, at least the company is going in, you know, there's a plan for it or it's going to go in a big, you know, new direction, it's got a future, this international company called Mondelez, they might hold on to their shares or they might eventually sell their shares for a higher price or wait until the stock market carries the price higher. So that's another way that you can acquire it. Then you do have this thing called a hostile takeover or hostile acquisition. In this case, the company doesn't want to be taken over. So there are different strategies that, uh, you know, kind of warlike type strategies that companies uh, will use to try to get shareholders and peel them away from the, 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 the existing company to get them to sell their shares. But that's called a hostile acquisition. So I'll go through it in, in, for a few minutes. A hostile acquisition, this is an acquisition of one company by another by going directly to the shareholders and making an offer to buy their shares. The alternative to going directly to the shareholders is to go to the board of directors and make a formal offer to buy the company. But the board of directors and the CEO say, no, we don't want to sell. So what happens is, okay, fine, we'll go to your shareholders. Those people are the ones that have the shares and the votes and who determines the board of directors. So they'll go directly to the shareholders, page 45, and make an offer to buy their shares or by, you know, using their voting power to place people on the board of directors to approve an acquisition. This is hostile because the purchase is attempted without the consent of the existing management of the company. Three different ways could be the purchasing company. They use a tender offer. They propose to purchase a majority of shares at a fixed price above the current market price and motivate shareholders to sell their shares to them. So they'll say, okay, the first 51% of shareholders in this company will get 20% higher than they would have gotten if they sold their shares in the normal market. So we'll buy your shares for what they're worth now, plus 20, maybe 30%, until we have 51%. Now, if you're fast, you get the offer. If you're part of the 49% that's slow, oh well, you lose. You don't get the bonus 30% that we're paying. So it's a way to push the shareholders to quickly try to sell their shares before they lose the benefits that they could get. So it's called a tender offer. This is a way to um, seduce shareholders into selling their shares. But that's, it works because there's a limit and it's a rush to get that benefit. Of course, the purchasing company can be patient, take its time and buy shares on the open market until they can reach 50 plus percent. This happens with uh, some football clubs like Manchester United. They decided to go public. To go public means that they're traded on the stock market and that you and I have the option to buy shares in Manchester United if we wanted to. But that also means that those shares can be bought by someone who wants to take over the company. And basically that's what happened. Uh, you see the Chevrolet on the Manchester United logo. It's been an American company. America has bought the Manchester football team for a few years. Which doesn't make people in Manchester very happy because they love their football team and they really want it to be locally owned. But now they can just complain about the American management all the time. Eventually, if they're patient, they may be able to buy 51% of the shares through the stock exchange on the open market. A proxy fight is another potential way to acquire. 
In this case, the purchaser persuades enough shareholders to vote to replace the management of the company with one that will approve the acquisition. So maybe in this case, the shareholders feel like happy. They don't want to really sell their shares, but they don't mind being acquired by the bigger company. So they can be convinced that they should change the board of directors to a more friendly um, uh, group to the acquirer. So if you have shares in a company that's very big, like Apple, you probably believe that they're going to continue to go up for the next 10, 15 years. You don't really want to sell them, but you might be able to find a way to shift the board of directors. So a proxy fight means to get someone else to fight for you in the board of directors. Um, <clears throat> then you have this other one, which I guess, you know, there are different parties involved. We have the, the, the company, the acquirer, we have the, 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 the acquiree, and then we have the board of directors, and then we have the actual shareholders. So the other alternative is called a bear hug. A bear hug an approach to a hostile takeover, which includes um, a buyer trying to convince the board of directors to sell the company without the support of the shareholders. That's kind of mean, right? But I mean, this, that would be, you know, a betrayal of the shareholders. So in this case, uh, it might be, uh, it might mean they lose their job, right? That means <laughs> if you're going to take over and then not tell the shareholders, they don't really have this one in, in it's ridiculous, why would they? Why would this guy in this book put hostile takeovers as the name of a video on YouTube? Does he really think that YouTube's not going to have 7,000 videos that are called hostile takeovers? Or even a game? Maybe there's a game called hostile takeover. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, poor choice again by Mr. Jason Hinton, by putting a YouTube link. What are you supposed to do, press the link in your book? That's pretty funny. Anyway, a bear hug approach to a hostile takeover involves a buyer making an offer to the company's board of directors to take over the company without approaching the shareholders. The proposed purchase and its offer share price is then made public. Aim is to put the squeeze on the board of directors to accept an offer they may not like through shareholder pressures and media pressure. So what you do is you go and you put the offer of how much you're willing to pay for the shares. You make the offer to the board of directors. You say, okay, we're going to pay this much for a share. Obviously going to be higher than the share price. And so now it's in the public, and now the board of directors is sitting there, even if they don't want to take this deal, the deal is on the table in front of them, the offer, basically. And it's in the media. And everybody's like, oh, company X wants to take over company Y. And they're going to make this much profit. And all the shareholders are calling the board of directors, yeah, why aren't you taking this offer? Come on, let's go. We want this money, so they hope that hugging the board of directors, putting them in a bear hug, will squeeze them, and then the shareholders will pressure them to make the deal. So, obviously there's a lot of thought that goes into these kind of scams and, and moves. Um, could this one be good? It's not going to be great, but it's a definite... We live in strange times. Uh, okay. What is a takeover? 
this of one company by another. So, yeah, I don't need to go through this whole thing, but I like this picture because, as I was saying before, I take over. Look at the fish. The big fish looks really happy, and the little fish, I don't know, maybe they're not unhappy, but they're going to be eaten, so then they're going to become part of that fish. Whereas if you were learning about mergers, if I was going to talk about mergers, which I will, um, it's a marriage. It's a marriage. It's different. So if the big fish uh, eats the little fish, then basically the big fish just decides all the different changes that are going to take place. Uh, they're going to control the management, probably, um, unless they get some benefit, right? So if they come to Vietnam and they are able to use the expertise of Vietnamese management to understand how to motivate employees in Vietnam, then no reason to rehire a bunch of employees. We'll just keep the factory running, we'll rebrand it. We'll sell different products, but we'll run the same factory and we'll have the same management. Could happen. Um, but the decision is being made by the, the acquirer, the big fish. In a merger, you might imagine, it's a marriage, so it's a little bit different. Um, so, uh, in that sense, you know, they're equals trying to join together. So I think the metaphor of the marriage is quite, quite good. It's not, not bad. But let me go and finish acquisitions before I go to mergers. Um, acquisition on page 46. <clears throat> A friendly acquisition occurs when the purchase of majority shares is part of an agreed negotiated process with the consent of the board of directors and the full disclosure to the shareholders. So just, you know, know the stakeholders involved. The buyer, and then inside the company you have the shareholders and the board of directors. In order for a purchaser to buy majority shares, 51%, existing shareholders may have to agree to sell their shares. It is more likely that shareholders will accept the offer if it's a friendly acquisition. I don't know why that is. I think that you're going to get more. They're just going to get better value. A danger in acquisitions. There are a few. A few dangers. One danger is you pay too much for the target business. And then you don't have enough capital to run it. So you have to be careful that you understand how much it's going to take to run that business when you take it over. Or if they have debts. <clears throat> if they have debts, then you get their debts. Management may see huge potential in the, law, in the target business, and this may seem to provide market entry. Market entry, a reason to be in the Vietnamese market. So Mondelez is now in the Vietnamese market because of Kindo. And they have a market share that is a starting point to build from. But, if too much is paid for it, the gains in sales and profits may not be enough to overcome the cover pur uh, purchase price and or to repay the debt that was used to finance the purpose. So you have to have a plan to break even. Of course, you want to take over a company that's profitable but not very innovative and add some innovation to it. That would be the best. Another important aspect is to bring something to the acquisition, which is what I'm talking about, and not just totally rely on the purchase business to be successful. There must be some kind of expertise, some technology you're bringing in, some systems, some marketing strategies, or some other innovation that will work to increase the success of the purchase business. This means that the acquisition will create a strong base, just the base level, that can be built on. We look at this Mondelez, they're talking about some very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're taking the number. It looks like what they're doing is they're taking the product line and kind of narrowing it down to the most uh, effective or better selling products. Like Oreo, Cadbury, AFC. And then, 
trying to create, uh, trying to use them to spring into other markets around Southeast Asia, maybe China too. So everybody wants a Chinese market. So the goal there is to become more efficient, more streamlined, less about uh, trying to uh, make minor profits in a retail business and more about supermarkets and economies of scale. That's what it looks like. And it's a base that they can build off because of the factories that Kindo already has in Vietnam. So, yeah. I think that's, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Acquisitions, there's different kinds of acquisitions. Mergers, okay, so I'll talk about mergers for a few minutes. And then in the next class, I'll probably finish up with strategic alliances and then talk about export risk next class. Uh, <clears throat> A merger, you know, if you think about a merger like a marriage, uh, that kind of, um, so a takeover, unlike a merger, is not a marriage of equals. There's a predator and a prey. There's a predator. Um, when you get married, when you, uh, you know, you have your, you have before you get married in your courtship, right? Before you get married to somebody, you have your independent lives. You have your habits. You have the things that you do. You have your stuff. Your stuff. And up until the time that you're married, you know, basically people don't really touch other people's stuff. And then a weird thing happens, is when you get married, all of a sudden, there's a question about, well, who, who, like, what, are, is this my stuff, or your stuff, or our stuff? Um, oh, so now everybody can touch each other's stuff, all of a sudden. <laughs> so, it's kind of, you know, it, it, you move in together, you put all of your stuff together, all of a sudden, people you know, one, maybe one partner will complain, like, do you really need to have all of those clothes? Do you really need to have so many X or Y or Z? Why do you have so many shoes or whatever? All of a sudden, there's a, there's a you know, a question of, like, how do you fit together in a living situation? And compromises need to be made in order to make the living situation work. So that's different from an acquisition, right? Because in the merger, there needs to be accommodation. Both sides are equal, so the decision making is going to be based on a new board of management and they're going to be put together into a, a new company with a new name. When you have a merger, uh, a famous merger was Sony Ericsson. We had Ericsson phones with Sony Corporation. They merged. Um, Microsoft, I think, and Nokia. Did they, they, maybe they didn't change their name. But there are, yeah, usually you have to change your name, and usually they mix the two names together in a merger. Um, <clears throat> So that's where I'll start in our book for a minute or two. <clears throat> a merger is when the shareholders of two companies become the shareholders of a new merged company. So that's complicated, right? To merge the shares of two companies. A merger is similar to an acquisition. However, both companies included are usually of similar size, highlight, and agree together to form a new company. Rather than purchase or take over, it is an agreement between two companies. Now, they can do that for benefits, different benefits that they can get from each other, horizontal or vertical. Typically, it involves a new name because you want to announce to the world that you're bigger, a new logo, and a slogan to launch and identify the new company. 
Now, a merger can lead to job losses in many cases because there would be people doing the same jobs. Now, we have two human resource departments, two accounting departments, two marketing departments. There are other rationalizations. The word rationalization means that you are cutting costs, basically. Retail outlets or offices may be rebranded in some clothes. So if you were to, let's say, have a merger between Domino's and Pizza Hut, for example, and there's a Domino's right next to a Pizza Hut, is it necessary to keep both of them if you merge into one pizza company? No. Get rid of the ones and spread out your space so you can cover more area and not have shops that are eating the customers from the shops that are already existing. So you might have to close some shops. So that means you either are going to move those employees to a new location or you're going to have a more efficient operation. <clears throat> So, yeah, so offices, you don't need to have two headquarters anymore. So you only need one. So we're going to move everyone to one office. We're going to move the husband and the wife into one house. You don't have to live in two apartments anymore. So we don't need to have two sofas. We don't need to have two stoves, two refrigerators. One of them will go. And that's what happens in the merger is that uh, pretty much uh, some of the assets are redundant. You don't need to have them anymore. They might have too many factories now. They might want to sell some other assets, equipment, buildings, vehicles. So they hope that uh, by cutting costs like this, that they'll be able to maintain a competitive advantage at the same time while growing and gaining economies of scale. It could work, I guess. Um, Facebook is buying WhatsApp. That was an acquisition. It was a friendly takeover. So now WhatsApp, when you open WhatsApp, it says WhatsApp and it says Facebook as well. Um, what are some big mergers? Examples. Mergers are harder. They're not always successful. They do get bigger. Disney and Pixar, there's a successful merger and the Marvel acquisition as well. Google and Android, that's a successful acquisition. So we'll just keep those two examples for now because I'm going to compare them. There are three main types of mergers. So the point of the merger, again, is to get bigger, increase market share, increase efficiency, rebrand, make yourself bigger, economies of scale. So why? So, uh, so, so imagine, so let's follow, a horizontal merger. Horizontal merger is on the same level, so uh, I think the example here might be are basically kind of. So that uh, mix is uh, going to create a horizontal merger which gives them more market share on that level. The main reason to have a horizontal mar uh, merger or acquisition really is to gain market share. It's the main reason. You're not trying to gain so much efficiency but you're trying to corner more of the market. Um, a horizontal merger or acquisition is when two companies in the same industry combine. For example, one company, if they're giving an example here, called Woolworths. It's a retail company, department store. They purchased another department store called David Jones for $2.2 billion. Woolworths is planning to use the David Jones stores to sell some of their South African brands. Woolworths also have customer relationship management technology that will be used to help the marketing of David Jones. So for the most part, 
They're just trying to increase the amount of retail shops they have, although they do have some technology that they can uh, supposedly bring that is going to help them to improve uh, the efficiency of their merged partner. But uh, I don't know if they made a new name out of it. Let's see. Ooh, are these the biggest ones of all time? Some of them did not work, by the way. <clears throat> I just want to find the names. Uh, Traveler City Court, they changed their name. Um, usually they change their names. What do they call themselves? Exxon Mobile, so these are two petrol companies, and they just changed the name from Exxon, they had one company, and Mobile, and they, Mobile, they just mixed them together and called themselves Exxon Mobile. Verizon and Vodafone, but they just kept, the, changed the name to Verizon Wireless. Okay, so, uh, so they became Travelers Group and City Corp merger. So what did they do? It became yeah AOL Time Warner. They just kept the same names. Um, that was a total failure of a merger. Though. But basically, horizontal mergers are there to increase market share and increase if. Uh, lucky you get economies of scale. Vertical mergers are about trying to control costs, right? So basically you're tired of either, you know, not making enough profit by selling your coffee beans to the retail shops because you see how much money they make from their espresso drinks and you're like, come on, we know you make 70000 for one drink and you're paying us this much for the beans? We're going to just make our own retail shops and we're going to make that profit and take your market share there too. Or maybe the suppliers are taking advantage of you and you making you pay too much for your supplies. So you decide to buy your supplier so then you can control the cost of your supplier. They cannot overcharge you. So a vertical merger is set up usually to save costs and to get control of one part of the market that's giving you problems. A vertical merger or acquisition occurs when a business buys or merges with one of its suppliers. <clears throat> Owning a supplier can reduce the operating costs and also increase competitive advantage. Control of the supplier can limit your competitor's access to a certain uh, ability to, uh, you can charge your support, okay, so if you have the supplier, you can also charge other customers more money too. So, there you go. Um, <clears throat> vertical mergers uh, would be an example of Google and Android. Okay, maybe Google wanted to work with uh, or maybe even a phone company, you know, that maybe they wanted to work with um, uh, the App Store from Apple, and Apple's like, no, it's incompatible, we're not going to do it with you, okay? All right, we need to make our own App Store, we have to find our own system, our operating system, because we can't use that operating system, so let's go buy one. And that's what happens with uh, a lot of companies in the tech world, it's like, well, we could build it ourselves, or we could just buy someone who's doing it already, or merge together with them. Vertical merger or acquisition has the same effect. All right, I'm not going to talk about conglomerates. Conglomerate, I'll just say quickly that a conglomerate is when there's no real goal except size. You're just trying to get bigger. You don't really, you know, there's no connection. You're like, why does this product go with that product? No, there's no reason. It's just another reason to get bigger. So when you look at conglomerates, you'll see uh, Unilever, they have a million products for supermarkets, but they're not really related to each other. All right, before we go, I think there's one interesting part of this video at the beginning.
beginning, which I will definitely not finish because it's too long, but I would introduce it to you. Um, and we'll come back to it later, but it's a pretty good video. About takeovers and mergers. Take, you'll take notes, it's no taking video. To the takeovers and also mergers. Let's uh, take a look at firstly some key terminology that you need to be uh, aware of and understand as you're working through this topic. Firstly, there is a difference between a takeover and a merger. A takeover, which to be honest is, is much the more common, involves a change of ownership where one business actually buys a controlling interest, usually 100% in a different business. It involves a change of ownership. Whereas a merger is typically uh, the combination of bringing together of two separate businesses into a new business. And often the, the enlarged or merged business is given a new name to reflect the fact that two businesses have been brought together. Don't forget that there's also a, a key distinction between external and organic or sometimes known as internal growth. So takeovers and mergers are a great example of external growth, growth that happens outside of the normal activities of the business. Organic growth is from within, e, for example, launching a new product or entering a new market, perhaps by opening a sales office. So takeovers are a key option when it comes to external growth. And as we'll see in a few, a few minutes, uh, it's also important to remember some terms that relate to key models that you can use to analyze and evaluate takeovers. Perhaps the most important is this concept of diversification from Ansos Matrix, which involves the bottom right box expanding into new markets and new products. That's often the case with the takeover, particularly takeovers that result in failure. It's a very risky strategy. We'll come back to diversification in a minute. Uh, just uh, three other terms to uh, highlight before we get into this topic in more detail. The first two are quite similar. They're connected with this concept called synergy. Synergy is something that happens as a result of bringing two businesses together. Uh, cost synergies are cost savings. Savings, reductions in costs that happen as a direct result of the takeover. Now those cost synergies could be both in the business that is being bought, the target, but they can also arise for the business that is doing the buying. For example, a typical cost synergy in a takeover is the elimination of duplicated uh, services, duplicated activities. So you, don't, you may not need two head offices, you may not need two sales teams or uh, two fleets of vehicles. You can often reduce the total costs in both businesses by bringing them together. It may well be that there are buying economies of scale from being bigger, therefore both businesses benefit from those low, lower costs. Revenue synergies are slightly different. They are synergies, but actually these are the opportunity to sell more as a result of the transaction takeover. For example, it could well be that the buying business suddenly now has access to a much wider customer base than it can sell its existing product to or that the takeover target has some distribution channels that it can make available uh, to the, 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 the buying business. So revenue synergies. And lastly, we're going to come on to this in a few minutes, a concept called shareholder value. The best way to think about shareholder value is what is the value, what is the return that is earned by the shareholders of the firm that does the takeover, that makes the investment. It's a method of investment appraisal. We'll come on to that. It's quite an interesting concept, really useful one for essays. We'll touch on that in a few minutes. Don't forget, as you do your essays, if you're writing an essay about takeovers, a really good way to build depth into your analysis is to make reference, not write whole pages, but make reference to relevant theories. And when it comes to takeovers, two models in particular are very personal. One on the left, obviously, Antos Matrix, we've mentioned diversification, which is the bottom right hand box. Uh, takeovers are essentially a, a, an issue of strategic choice. It could well be that if the strategy is market development, bottom left hand box, the takeover may be one of the best options for achieving and pursuing that strategy. Similarly, the one on the right, the model on the right, the, uh, which is Porter's generic strategies, 
uh, you can often link back the motives for the takeover uh, to uh, maybe the objective, the strategy is to be a cost leader, maybe the objective is to be a highly differentiated business. You can often link back the motives of the takeover uh, to Porter's model. Don't forget that with takeovers, what you're really looking at is a I will, I will agree with him, uh, what he said about that, you can use the matrix, because it's all about growth, right? You just want to remember that you're growing, so you do have that choices about your marketing and what your focus should be in the new market. So, if you're um, an old product in a new market, you might want to do a takeover Kindle. Maybe that's the best strategy for you. Now, if you couldn't find a factory that could make your product because it was too new, then you couldn't do that. A fairly crucial business strategic decision. And when it comes to all strategic decisions, a key point to make to the examiner is that strategy is all about choice. And let me explain that briefly by reference to, to takeovers here. Takeovers are just one alternative. So if we look at the yellow shape there, uh, there are a variety of different strategic directions a firm can take. Let's say, for example, that the, the strategy, chosen strategy from the board is international expansion. Perhaps expanding into faster growing emerging markets. Perhaps they want to have a presence in China. What are the alternatives? Well, takeovers are one of the alternatives, by and large. But they're not the only alternative. So there's always an option to pursue an organic or internal strategy, launching new products, exporting direct. There's also nearly always an option to do something other than buy another business, perhaps to form some kind of strategic alliance or enter into a joint venture with a partner rather than going. So this is what I was talking about in the last episode, for example. Uh you are going to either go into the market in a very simple way, uh, organic growth or internal growth. You're just going to invest your own money and try to build an export market slowly. Or, for example, you get involved in these, uh, these more complicated uh, elements of um, joint ventures trying to, uh, and having to spend lots of money to put your name into the market, takeovers and mergers. Um, the next class I'll finish up with these uh, joint ventures and strategic alliances, but there's definitely, um, yeah, there's, it's, it's definitely gets more, more money and more risk in going into this middle area. So innovation, okay, uh, yes, you would want to take over and, and maybe make a merger for that um, because you have something you can bring to the company that's a little bit maybe conservative or old school and then uh, diversification yes maybe you want to have different product choices maybe there's some things that you can get involved with that you wouldn't have been able to uh, international expansion obviously uh, gaining some cost leadership in your market at home, not only in the foreign market, that would be another reason. The whole hog ho and taking over business in, in an international market. So it's very important to remember that strategy is all about choice. The takeovers, by and large, it's very rare for a takeover to be forced on a business. By and large, they're an option, an alternative. And therefore, if something is optional, there must be some alternatives. One of the key things to consider is is to take over the best of the options. There is another final concept that I just want to introduce because I think it, it really does enable you to, to analyse and evaluate takeovers in quite a powerful way, which is a concept called strategic fit. I'm not even sure you'll find this in the main head of the business textbooks, but if it's not there, it really should be. And the reason for this is that the best way to assess whether a takeover or the merger is right for the business, is whether or not it fits with the strategic objectives of the business and the capabilities of the business. So, for example, if the, if the objective of the firm is to be a global market leader, 
the chances are that significant takeovers of, of significant businesses in, in important global markets is pretty likely to fit quite closely with the strategy. It's likely to have good strategic fit. If the, uh, the, the strategy of the business is to minimise risk, chances are a takeover doesn't fit very well with that strategy because to a large extent, most takeovers are high-risk transactions. And the beauty of the strategic fit concept is that it links really nicely with the models and some of the other stuff that you may have, you may have covered earlier in your course. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's take the second one down there, Port of Generic Strategies. Uh, let's say... Uh, You're starting to be familiar with all of these, right? So you know Porter's strategy already. That's the uh, adaptive or standardization one. A, your, your strategy, your chosen strategy, is to be a cost leader, to be the, the lowest cost operator in the market, and uh, the, the way in which you intend to do that is to be the biggest, to have to, to generate significant economies and scale. Now, uh, you identify a takeover of a large competitor, and a result, as a result of that takeover, you can achieve significant cost synergies. Those cost synergies, if they are achieved and sustained, should enable unit costs of the enlarged business to fall, thereby allowing the business to improve its competitive position as a cost leader. So a takeover of a large competitor that results in real cost synergies will be entirely consistent and a close fit with the strategy. Moving back to, uh, to Portal. Why do firms undertake takeovers? Well, partly, as we've suggested, it's part of the strategy. And indeed, strategic motives, by and large, are good motives for firstly evaluating and secondly going ahead with the takeover. However, be aware that there are other reasons. Why. This is a very good video, and, uh, but it should be. We're going to talk about this again when we talk about uh, change and the problems when you do all these kind of strategic alliances. So, this is a good place to stop, probably. Uh, strategic motives, you want to get market share, you want to develop a business, you want to get some technology, you want to uh, figure out where you can get a competitive advantage in a new market. So those are reasons for takeovers. Of course, there's financial motives that have to do with both profit. There's only two things that can happen. You can either sell more, make more, have a bigger market, or save money on costs and then make more profit that way. There's only two financial motives most of the time. And then you have managerial motives. Sometimes you have egoists and uh, people who want to be big, uh, you know, they, they think bigger is better. It's the interest of managers. They think they can raise their price of their shareholder value that they have shares in and they can make money for themselves. And this is not always, again, in the best interests of the company itself. It's more thinking about the managers. The managers are concerned with their own egos and their own success. So managerial motives are not always the best. Anyway, uh, three main kinds of motivation for takeovers. I'll put this video, you can pause it here, or uh, I'll put this video up on as a support video for this lecture. Next lecture will be about uh, joint ventures and uh, finish up with the different kinds of mergers and acquisitions that there are. And then we'll go into exports risk next week. Have a good day.